Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm going to do a book review for you today, and as you can see, it has something to do with Pierce Brown. I'm going to be reviewing Morningstar by Pierce Brown. This is the third and final book to the Red Rising trilogy. It starts with Red Rising, Golden Sun, and then Morning Star. If you have seen my channel, you know that I've reviewed both of these. I'll link them down below. This is the third book, so if you're watching this, you should have read the first two books unless you just like being spoiled and if you do that's a little weird but to each their own you can do whatever you want um i'm gonna tell you that this is a science fiction series that is pretty high paced and adventurous it goes off onto this wonderful adventure that you follow and it goes so many different places you are all across the solar system you are following all of these amazing people Pierce Brown's writing is one of my favorites that I've ever read. It has definitely gotten up there in my favorite books. This is my favorite series of the year. There's nothing that can top it already. I'm sorry for future, like, debut novels and anything, but I can't say enough about this. So I need you to go and pick up and read it. So start with the first one. So Red Rising, obviously. And then you can continue and then meet me back here for Morningstar at the end. So go do that. I'll talk to you in a little bit. Okay? Bye. Welcome back, Howlers, for those of you who have read this. Oh my gosh. As you can see, I have no words that properly proclaim how great and amazing the series is. I've heard mixed reviews, I've gone and like looked at what other people have written, and I don't know how you miss some of the amazing things, but personally, this series has spoke to me in just the most like vast way and I can't get it out of my head ever. My friend's sister is having a baby and she was like baby names and I was like Darrow. Darrow's the first name. I can tell you other ones like Severo, Cassius, Julian. We're gonna continue and obviously they're a little bit out there but I love his writing and his naming and just freaking everything. We're gonna see if I can be coherent throughout this video because this book killed me. If you guys have been following, you know that I've been reading them in audiobook as well as in physical form, so I continued along with Morningstar. I was just gonna read it because obviously it goes faster when you read it and the audiobook is over 20 hours, but I absolutely love Tim Gerard Reynolds voices and he has Darrow as this kind of Scottish accent and it changed when he became an Aurea and when he became gold but you can still tell that it's him and so all of his inner thoughts and of course were in his mind throughout the story in first person narrative so it's this just rich voice and it's it's wonderful to listen to and it's wonderful to hear my favorite voice actually that he uses is Ragnar's because it's this deep deep voice that is so like otherworldly and obviously he is otherworldly because he's a, a scarred and ch I mean he's not a scarred he's a stained okay thoughts inside starting off this book we start with Darrow in a really really dark place I started listening to the audiobook as I was driving to the airport side story my car kind of hates me right now because the um, check-in or the door jar sensor is broken so sometimes it just randomly beeps at me and sometimes it's a lot and sometimes it doesn't happen. I started listening to this and Darrow is in the box and thinking about death and thinking about all of his life and his decisions and everybody who's out there and if they know that he's alive and just the darkness and struggle that he's going through in this solitary confinement. And my car is beeping at me the entire time that I'm driving to the airport. We're hearing Darrow only in the dark, like deep in the darkness, far from warmth and suns and moons I lie, quiet as the stone that surrounds me. Beep, 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 beep. I'm like, oh my gosh. This, it's, oh, it was so ridiculous. But we got through it and he escaped. Obviously we knew that he was going to escape. You're not going to have him in confinement for this entire book. This is, this is a good amount of book that things need to happen. So we're waiting until he's going to get saved. We don't know who, we don't know when, and then he goes in there and they have like shaved his hair and are going to 
ruin his hand and you're just like no he, he's a hell diver he needs his hand and then Treg and Holiday are there and they're freaking awesome and so they come and clutch and kill all of 13 Legion and get Darrow out of there that okay they was <laughs> Having an unreliable narrator is so difficult because obviously it's unreliable and you don't know what's happening. So Darrow is in this mindset that you're like, is, is everything real? Are they trying to trick you again? The freaking jackal is out of his mind? What's he going to do to you? Oh, he's going to let you escape and then he's going to torment you even more? I don't know. They put the snake bite in him and can like get him there and freaking Aja. Oh my gosh. So there's a whole bunch of different villains that we have obviously there's just intricacies in all of the politics and everything that he writes it's so wonderful and rich and i'm just gonna keep going i love his writing okay where that's baseline i'm sorry i'll that's the last that we'll see of it they use all of the reds to escape and it's amazing oh i mean like red mentality so instead of just going off into the stars and trying to like get a ship and escape from magia from the jackals freaking house of terror they go into the ground because that's where everybody lives because they're all hell divers and reds and miners and they can use the planet against the golds because that's not where they are they built it up from their bones and oh my gosh it's brilliant and then we see Severo I love Severo from the beginning he's just such a snarky little goblin and we see him from the beginning, you obviously know that he's going to be important from Red Rising when they were at the Institute, and you kind of see Severo, and you just hearing his name, or like, seeing his name to begin with, I'm like, oh, Severus, like, Severus Snape. And then, so I just imagine this, like, lanky little white, black-haired boy that's just, oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm a loner off in the side. You should not befriend me. <laughs> and he just becomes this spunky little wolf that is amazing and starts the howlers and has such loyalty and I just love his character so much and him and Ragnar have been battling it out for a year and he's Ares he had to take up his father's pedestal by himself <sighs> he is such a deep character I love it and I love that we get to see all of their arcs stuff happens stuff goes down and you don't get to see all of the happiness and anything that goes on until the very end, until it's deserved. Because they have to reach their lowest point. Severo has to go through all of this. He was by himself, and even though he was trying to find Darrow, he had to fight this war and he doesn't know how. It's not for him. And even their, like, battle of power when they go and find Quicksilver, and then they almost kill Mustang, and what the hell is happening? Severo just, like, he's been at war by himself so he can kill everybody and it doesn't matter? No. Friends first. And he obviously puts friends first, but it was so intense. All of those scenes. And when he tried to blow up everything on Phobos, that's one of the things that I love about relationships between guys. I know there's a stereotype that like girls are always going to be petty and like, oh, I said this passive aggressive thing and I need you to pick up on it or I'm going to gossip about you. And guys can just like be mad at each other and oh, hit you, like punch, right hook, going to draw some blood, we're going to wrestle and all of the anger gets out and then they're panting on the floor and are just like, you good? Yeah, you good? Yep. We're arm in arm, let's go. Fight this war. And it was just, it was adorable, because even though, like, the life of a lot of people on this moon, and, like, the economy was in danger of being blown up, it was still just, like, it needed to happen. They had the clashing of heads when Daryl finally found his feet and was like, okay, I'm ready to take up my part, I'm ready to be the Reaper, and continue this battle. Also, Quicksilver is a Red Rising person. He's a son of Ares. He's like one of the OG sons of Ares with Fitchner. I did not see that coming. That was such a... All of these twists are so good. It's not even that long, but so much freaking happens in this book. And it's so amazing. I can't. I can't. Now they're gonna go to the Obsidians. So they wrangle everybody up all of them are friends again mustang comes in and nobody understands her this is another it's it's not a trope but it's a very like thing where people don't trust 
the girl that has been working for them the whole time. So we kind of see this in other stories like Throne of Glass and um, things like that where this person has been fighting for this cause the whole time and then once they get into the cause to like meet up with other people of the rebel cause and they're just like mm, I don't know if I trust you you've been making like some decisions that are okay so when Mustang comes in obviously her and Daryl are of one mind and they belong together and like she's been holding Orion for him and taking care of them and making sure that they're like fighting for the Reds and for this cause and she's with the Telemannises and it like comes back to him. It's just like, okay, I want to fight for this better world. And it was just like, yeah, I don't know. I don't really trust you. And dancers being all prejudiced and like colorist. And then Victra, because they didn't get along before and she didn't trust him. Also, I love Victra <laughs> because she has been so loyal the whole time and is just this like ice queen but has a heart of gold and like just wants to be in their friendship and like made it and he saved her and it's just all so great. Her and Severo are adorable like you didn't realize it and then Severo grew that goatee and it was so cute and you're just like oh okay like you're you're a thing now I get it this is cute I'm, I'm okay and you just imagine like Victra this like tall goddess warrior and then Severo's just this like janky little goblin <laughs> and then they're in love oh I love it all right so then they're gonna go try and get all the obsidians to get everybody and Ragnar understands that he's might have to kill his mother and he's just so Ragnar's amazing. His character arc is so good from this slave and this like huge stage that reaches through this molten door in order to give his services to Darrow and then is actually the one who Darrow confides in and is able to bring him out of slavery and make him his own person and gives him the razor during the Iron Rain and then like spends that year with Severo, becomes the shield of Tinos in order to be that shining star and just that huge just presence that is needed and so he's this huge like stained obsidian that everybody is intimidated by but he's actually adorable and like all of Darrow's nieces and nephews are like when does the giant bring us gifts like do we have things and plays all over his like it's so cute love how he can write all of these war stories and everything like Again, I'm going to use the Iliad. It's just kind of just an anthology of how many different ways you can kill somebody with a spear. And obviously it's very deep and poetic, but he takes that and is able to institute all of this war talk and death and violence. A lot of people die and a lot of characters that we do and there's obvious bloody gore that happens throughout these. But he's able to like put these little pockets of innocence and love and what the actual meaning behind all of this fighting and the reason for this cause is without like thrusting it on you and be like oh remember because we're doing this for love when it's really not the like heart of it but it really is and he's able to like thread that effortlessly through everybody it's just so adorable and like meaningful and heartening to have that be the beginning to end thread because Darrow starts on his journey after Eo dies and wants to fight for his wife's dream and then is able to find all of these new friends in enemy territory and then change the paradigm of the world and even with the loss of people like Ragnar it was so heartbreaking but he got to see his sister and everything that happens you get to continue on to the end to a better world I love it. I absolutely love it. Got pretty real for a second there. Alright, the culminating scene. All of it was so amazing. And so you start, and obviously you're not going to be led into all of the secrets and like why this happens. And so they go to save Cassius because he has kind of shown that he's a little bit on their side. Him and Darrow had their like drinking night while he was still in handcuffs and like watched some of the Institute things that Roke had been watching. They go and save him, and he shoots Severo! So they're there, and he's just, something's wrong, and he's holding his hand for too long, and he freaking takes his pistol and shoots Severo. And obviously, like, he, he had been on the crate, and he had, like, Pierce Brown had mentioned that he had this, like, vest on, this tactical vest that he didn't like, and so I was thinking, oh, he's gonna be fine, because he has a vest on. Like, the, the, it's not 
him do anything. His pistol. It does. He kills him and he's bleeding and there's just, there's no, it just happens and then they move on and they throw him in the box with Darrow and Mustang. Takes Antonia and they already have clearance and they go and see the Sovereign and bring him there and they're in the heart of enemy territory and you're thinking, well, this is the end. I know it is. They bring him in there and then Aja's in there and everybody, even though they make everybody leave, kill Antonia, the Jackal's there, freaking has whatever leverage he has, we don't know what's going on. And then Cassius comes through with his heart of gold. So loving, loving this, making him like have his full circle coming around and then we all knew that Darrow didn't make the play for killing all of the Bolognas, it obviously wasn't his fight, he was not an Augustus, freaking Jackal hate Adrius, want him to die. Fights ensue, they're trying to go, Aja's just Aja, so we're just like, you've killed everybody and you can't have any more. You killed Ragnar, you killed Leah, you, or Antonia killed Leah, but she killed Quinn, and god damn it, you can't have another one of them. And so they're all like going and this just shows how much of a badass Aja is and she was just written so well that all three of them and Darrow, I mean, his hand is cut off. They cut off his Helldiver hand. Freaking Adrius shouldn't have done that. It wasn't part of the plan. And then he comes in and makes Cassius do it. And Cassius cuts off his hand, which is just good <laughs> at the point. You're like, yep, that was, it was like payback because you obviously cut off his arm. But I mean, he got his arm back. I'm sure that the same can happen for you. You just need to make sure you get your hand back. What? <laughs> Aja, and then they can't handle it, they can't do it. Guess what? Oh, they're gonna go over to Sephiroth's corpse. Yep, they have a snake fight. Wakey, wakey, goblin. Let's go. Oh, when I read that, I did one of the, like, it was on the other page. When you're reading and, like, something, it, like, super, super intriguing is happening, and then move, like, you just kind of, you just kind of glance, and then it, you see it. And I saw that, like, he said, wakey, wakey, goblin. And I was like, oh, Severo's not dead. So everything's okay. It's all right. Victor will be fine. They just got married. And so she needs to be alive. And yes, he's fine. So Snakebite gets him up. <laughs> Obviously, Severo. I was like, what the hell? You got blood on you. Daryl, what's happening? You're missing it. You're missing a bloody hand. You're missing a bloody damn hand. What the hell? And he's just like, there's, I'm so, we just, let's go help. We have to fight Aja. Okay, I'll be back. We're gonna go do that real quick. Fight off the best person in ever history of being able to use a razor. Okay, great. And then Severo gets to kill Aja and just like end all of this tyranny and I felt bad for Lysander because he has to sit there and watch Aja die and then his grandma's dying on the ground and then like her last words are kill Adrius and what? Like she, she gets her, she gets her kind of revenge thing, justice comes to her in the end, which is great. Obviously everybody's kind of crazy in the head thinking that gold is better and they've been brainwashed for this for the entire generations and she's been a sovereign for 60 years. And so her reign of terror is over. But guess what? There's still some reign of terror happening and he's right over there because when she dies, the jackal starts laughing, cackling. And I just imagine the hyenas from Lion King are just like that, mostly Ed, but like all of them just surrounding and the jackal's just over there with his arm skewered into the ground and he can't reach it with his bloody stump of his arm because he's insane and just starts cackling and I just imagine Ed and like all of them laughing at things and then Lilith is in the background even though she's on the ship being his insurance policy and he has freaking taken all of the nuclear missiles that Darrow even tried to use as leverage for Romulus when they were out in the rim and destroyed the sword armada he wants to be sovereign you can't have everything Jackal you're a freaking psycho you can't even fathom it because obviously we weren't alive during World War II, during Hiroshima and Nagasaki. We heard about it. It's all in our history. But how much devastation that can wield. And they're on Luna and they have like it just killed a million people in a second just because his sister said a word. And that is a kind of villain that will never be not terrifying. Some villains can obviously have worse traits and everything, but an unhinged villain that just doesn't care and, like, changes life. And I kind of, 
I was very worried about Severo at the beginning for having that, and he was just like, we can just kill everybody, it's war, this is what's happening, everybody has to die. And I was like, no, Severo, don't go down that path. And obviously he came back, and then everything's happy, and him and Daryl are friends again, and he gets to marry Victra. But that kind of reckless abandonment of morality is something that's always terrifying to the core, that you just don't know what they're going to do and how far they'll go and they don't care as long as they get what they think that they want. And that was such a poignant way to end it and then having them all come together so something that devastating is going to bring them together rather than just the uprising because not everybody's going to come to the same side. Obviously it's gold versus the other colors and to have gold kill their own kind and not care about it takes the Ash Lord and like Lysander being like I know that he killed Rhea and like destroyed it but it still haunts him obviously taking that many lives and destroying an entire moon has an impact on somebody and haunts his dreams so having that and then having everybody turn on Lilith and freaking kill her wonderful thank you thank the Lord for that creepy little just demon child to be out of this realm <laughs> So Lilith is no longer there, and then they drag the Sovereign's head and the scepter, and Mustang is now the Sovereign, and we can go about the world, and obviously Darrow was meant to be the sword, and is the Reaper, and got her there, but she was always the end goal, and even Ragnar knew that, and I love that that just culminated everything, even trying to get her back into the story. And then we have the epilogue that... They're just on the coast. So I'm in Oregon and I go to the coast a lot because I absolutely love it. And that's sort of just, I imagine them, they just went and then she's, she's the president. Like, it, like she's a president, but she gets to have her little moments with her husband or like whatever they are right now. And the, then the Secret Service are like a good enough distance away that they're able to have their own moments. Having this wonderful conversation and kind of realize that it's over and that they get to be honest with each other and that he's finally passed her test and then the whole family comes and he's like, are we expecting company? Yeah, everybody's coming perfectly because everybody knows that you have a kid and that you can finally have this and be a father because that's what you wanted and what killed you and you finally realized that Eo was pregnant when she died and she didn't think that it's son. And... <sighs> Literally this entire review is just me gushing over everything that happens and I'm not sorry for it. It's wonderful. And I'm very happy with the ending. I'm so excited because Pierce Brown is, uh, j has just released his new graphic novels that he's continuing in with the story. It's called The Son of Ares, and I'll link it down below. And it's so, so exciting, and I can't wait to continue in this world. And just love every character, and they're just wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> That's all the rambling that I can give you. Craziness aside, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you have a fantastic day and I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye. Talking about this out of context is just so... <laughs> it's it's great. I love it. This is so... Just circle, 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 circle. And I just imagine the hyenas from Lord of the Rings. What? 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 <laughs> Lord of the Rings? Okay.